This Week in Radio Tech, episode 281, is brought to you by the Axia Fusion AOIP Mixing Console. Fusion, where design and technology become one. By the Telos HX6 Talk Show System. Perfect for request line callers and serious newsmakers alike. Six lines and two digitally clear Telos hybrids in one rack unit, the Telos HX6. And by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. In our quest for better internet audio streaming, we're taking a closer look at Apple's HLS. Greg Oganowski joins me, Kirk Harnack, to take a deep dive into how Apple HLS adaptive streaming works at the encoder end, server, and for the end user. Hey, welcome in. It's This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. Glad you could join us, whether it's you're joining us live on the GFQ network or watching it later on from GFQ or YouTube or uh, on uh, my website, This Week in Radio Tech. We're glad you're here. This is the show where we talk about everything, I hope, from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and all the stuff in between, which now includes there's a whole lot of branches on that tree now. And uh, the biggest one probably is uh, is streaming. So we're going to get to that here in just a minute. Uh, I'm coming to you live from Nashville, Tennessee, from my uh, office here. And as a disclaimer, I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. And uh, as as you may discover, or we're actually uh, trying to make it not too obvious, the Telos Alliance makes a few products that compete with our guests' products. And so this show is about our guest and what he has to say about uh, streaming and uh, and his products that help do that in a really effective way. So I'm delighted to have Greg Oganowski on the show. Let's go ahead and bring him in. Hi, Greg. How you doing? Glad you're uh, here from California. Good to see you. Hey, Kirk. Thanks for having us. Um, we're coming to you from lovely suburban L.A. And trees and streams go together. They do. They do. Somebody needs, come, somebody needs to come across with a product called willow because that's the kind of tree that grows next to a stream. Yeah, I think there was a product called willow, come to think of it. I don't remember what it was, though. Really? Anyway. Yeah. You know, the first thing we, <laughs> this being a commercial broadcast, believe the first me, thing we Believe me, a, a, any word you could possibly think of, there's a software package named after it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. It's hard to come up with something uh, new and innovative. Hence all the baby names, you know, of products on the internet uh, or the unpronounceable ones. So uh, our show is uh, brought to you by a few sponsors. And the first one that I want to tell you about, uh, we're just going to see an ad. I've got a friend, a business partner, actually, uh, Larry Fuss. And Larry is the driving force behind our little radio stations. We have six stations in uh, Mississippi and two in American Samoa. And uh, Suncast is going to roll this, and Larry's going to tell you about why he likes audio over IP with Axia. We had three radio stations in one building on the other side of town, and then we ended up with another radio station here and decided to consolidate everything into one facility. And so what you see here, or what you will be seeing here, is four radio stations combined into one facility. And in the process of moving, we decided that we would uh, switch over to the uh, Axia platform. Part of the reason is because we were changing automation as well to uh, Rivendell, and Rivendell works very well with the Axia system. When we decided to consolidate everything, we used to have separate control rooms for each radio station, but several of them had no live local programming. It's all either syndicated stuff or voice tracked. So we decided, well, we don't need a control room, a separate control room for those stations anymore. So we decided to consolidate. Now we have one big, massive control room here, and uh, that's pretty much where we do everything for four radio stations. Uh, morning show on one of them is live. Uh, we do a, a live talk show on the AM in middays at, at one time we did and then uh, we do a, a, a night show on one of the other stations all live from this room and all via the uh, Axia. In the old facility we had literally miles and miles of analog audio wiring studio to studio studio to rack uh, rack to the other studio it was just lots of wiring and one whole wall of um, punch blocks Every bit of that's gone now because all we have in between this room and the rack room is a couple of runs of Cat5 cable. 
there's a whole lot less wiring involved this way, which of course means a lot less time involved in setting up an Axia system than in wiring up a plant with analog consoles in every room. We had already installed one smaller Axia console at another radio station that we own about 35 miles from here, and it has worked so, so well that when the decision was made to move this station or these stations and consolidate them, we looked at all that wiring, we looked at all those punch blocks, and we said, we ain't doing that. Uh, we're going to go with Axia and eliminate all that because, first of all, it made the move a whole lot simpler. Since we put the Axia system in, everything has run a lot smoother, which is the main thing I'm concerned about. I don't have the engineer coming in every day telling me we need to buy this part. Something's gone down. Uh, with the one studio, everything is located in one room. We can go in there. All the production for the commercials is done there. The board is easy to use. Uh, everything just works very smoothly. Uh, one other thing that I really like about the uh, Axia system is the flexibility. If I decide to do a Southern Miss football game, I can either automate it or I can have somebody uh, come in and do it by pushing the buttons and and getting it on the Air Force. I wouldn't do it any other way. Uh, I've got uh, two more radio stations in another market, thousands of miles from here, literally, uh, even in a different hemisphere, as a matter of fact. And we put Axia in there, too, after our first experience with Axia. I would never build another analog plant again. And thanks a lot to uh, Axia and the folks at the Telos Alliance for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And thanks to Larry Fuss for that uh, heartfelt uh, um, uh, testimonial about uh, our Axia experience in Greenville, Mississippi. All right, This Week in Radio Tech, it's episode 281. Greg Oganowski is our guest. And Greg's uh, got a company uh, that he is promoting streams, hi-fi, and coders. Greg, uh, it's great to have you back. You've been on the show a couple of times before, and I'm, I'm glad you're here now. But you've got something to talk about. Um, we've talked about streaming in the past, but you got there's a new kind of streaming that you're going to be telling us all about. Where should we start in this, uh, in this subject of uh, adaptive streaming, especially Apple HLS? What do you think? Well, um, f once again, uh, thanks, thanks an awful lot for the opportunity to uh, appear here. It's... Um, uh, a wonderful opportunity. And before we go any further, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, speaking of the uh, Axio um, audio over IP protocols, all of our uh, encoders are fully uh, Axio compatible. So you install the driver and away you go with streaming. And uh, just like the other fellow said about never doing another analog or even a digital installation again, um, I can't agree more. Uh, it's just the way to go. You get one crimp tool and a bunch of Cat Five, and you're off. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Ed. Yeah. Thanks for pointing out that uh, that the Axia drivers work with your product, and uh, and that's great. That you there's there's no there's no hitch in the giddy up there. It works great. That's correct. Uh, the only thing I haven't tried is more than one protocol at once, but I, I would imagine that that uh, that may not go so well. But that's another story. Gotcha. I don't think it, but I don't think anybody needs to go there. But trust me, somebody. Somebody in Europe is going to complain about that. <laughs> That's right. We want we want Ravenna AES67 and Livewire. Uh, oh, oh and Wheaton no, no, IP. They'll, they'll want, no, 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 no. Ravenna oh. and Livewire. That'll be a piece of cake. Okay. Because <laughs> you, you guys you guys are actually uh, reading from the same hymnal there. No, what <laughs> yeah, somebody's yeah. going to do one day? We're going to wake up and somebody's going to want to run Dante. They're going to want to run. Uh, oh. uh, Big W, they're going to want to run um, uh, Axia and Ravenna. Like I say, those two, I'll bet you any money those run together. Because the, the yeah, the, yeah, the, the the networking is is the same for both. Uh, but uh, you know, the AES67 and AVB and others, a lot of those take a, a different kind of clocking. They take that what IEEE 1588 uh, clocking standard, uh, which which, but which, which guys, live wire. Axia is yeah. moving in that direction anyway, yeah. so it's just a matter of changing the clocking because the RTP between Axia and Ravenna is identical. Yeah. But anyway, getting back to HLS, um, HLS is a very, very interesting way to stream now. Mm -hmm. um, it pretty much addresses every complaint that anyone ever had about streaming except the whole idea of the fundamental flaw of streaming. I know I brought this up before. Okay. Um, streaming is fundamentally flawed in that it doesn't have a clock mechanism. Oh, so, yeah, the clock thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's pretty much what's, what separates the uh, streaming protocols from the audio over IP protocols, such as Axia, for example. Um, there's a clock that's sent 
with Axia, with streaming, there isn't. And the only way it stays up is you build yourself a buffer in the, uh, in the player and uh, you have to fill the buffer. And sooner or later, you've got to deal with the unfortunate mess of either a buffer underrun or a buffer overrun. Um, there are some creative ways to deal with this with sample rate conversion, but then that has speed issues which yeah. can or cannot be audible. Um, I might point out if you have an SRC in the way that the uh, uh, Nielsen PPM will not propagate through it, so it destroys that. Mm. Um, but be that as it may, streaming is what it is. Um, it's an inexpensive way to deliver. And uh, for the most part, with crystal controlled clocks, uh, the source clock and the destination clock, streams will hold up for several hours. Hey, so uh, um, let's go back to something that you said at first, and that is this HLS streaming, which you're going to explain pretty well to us. Um, it solves several complaints. Let's, let's enumerate what a couple or three of those complaints about regular streaming have been. Well, probably the first one would be buffers. Um, okay. You connect to a stream, and uh, you, you have to keep that thing up. It's, uh, it's got uh, contiguous data. Um, the buffer will be very player compliant, or I mean player dependent, yeah, um, yeah. depending on how the player has been written, uh, how the buffer management is dealt with, uh, will determine the robustness of the, uh, of the player client. And uh, once so again, I've noticed you know, that that uh, and I'm sorry to, 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 to jump yeah, in. I've a, just got so many ideas to jump in. I've noticed there, that, for example, a, a ton of detail here. One of the first players I ever used was Winamp. And when used with a shoutcast server, it did something fairly smart. It would load up its buffer as fast as possible because the server had a bunch of data stored in it. It had, what, 20 seconds or so worth of uh, audio streaming stored up in it. That, so I was already that, delayed 20 seconds. And then the Winamp would fill up quick and start playing me right away. And then once its buffer got full, it would then be streaming at the normal pace with a full buffer, uh, mo most of the time a full buffer. Correct. But, Correct. It, but when I use, um, I have a TuneIn app on my Android phone. When I punch up one of my radio stations using just a standard uh, uh, Shoutcast protocol, the TuneIn app doesn't preload the buffer. And so I sit there and wait while it says 10%, 20%, 30%. So I wait until the buffer yeah, TuneIn <gasps> tune hasn't gotten the idea about Burst on Connect. That's, that's technically that, that Burst protocol. on Connect. There you go. I knew there's a word for that. On Burst connect. on Connect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and their player doesn't support it. So, you, you know, you're right. You sit there and wait. And then uh, the other popular protocol that, uh, that is used is Adobe's um, RTMP. Now, <clears throat> that thing is really horrible because there's no buffer on the server at all, and they offload the buffer problem uh, exclusively to the player. Okay. So the problem there is while you're loading the buffer in the player, you can't play because you, have, you, don't, you don't get the data yet. So mm. you've got a preload. So if you want to set up a 10-second or a 20-second buffer, when you go to click to play the stream, you've got to wait for the buffer to fill, and it will be that 10 or 20 seconds before it can start to deliver audio. Otherwise, uh, yeah. the buffer yeah. mechanism won't work. And, and just as a consumer, this is a, a bit of a pain. You know, you, you go, you open an app, or you click on a tune-in station that you like, or whatever your method is, and then you wait. And, and that it just seems like that period of ambiguity has got to cause at least a little slight bit of anxiety in anybody who's wanting to do that. Hey, I've got a, I've got a, uh, a I believe it's a Grace brand uh, commercial radio. It's on the backside of, of my rack right here. It's intended for use in what, barber shops and stores and whatever. It's kind of commercial looking. It hooks into the PA system of, of your store. Um, uh, it, it does sit there and just works and works and works, and I like it. But my goodness, it takes forever to buffer up. I don't know what its deal is, but when I tune into, I mean, it, it's got iHeart Radio in there, and it's got several presets all set up. And when I tune in a station, it just, it just takes it. Uh, some, it, it feels like half a minute before I start getting yeah, audio. Th those things have. I, I've spoken to the people over at Grace about that device. It's got a real underpowered. Um, a processor in it for one thing. Uh, they obviously don't support any burst on connect. So, you know, it's, it's, it's got everything going uh, against it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so so buffering and slow so, to start so, is, so, is one, buffering, one problem. Buffering is like the number one the number one problem. Uh, the, the next thing that's really important is, um, especially with the terrestrial radio stations, everybody wants to do ad insertion now. Oh, so yeah. Now you need something that has accurate cueing. And Shoutcast and Icecast can't deliver that because contrary to popular belief, um, the metadata is not frame accurate in Shoutcast and Icecast. It has to succumb to what they call a metadata interval, which is a, a parameter that gets set on the server itself. And uh, the, um, it, it's expressed in bytes. So even though you may send the metadata right when you think you've sent it, mm -hmm. it is sent out of band. It is not uh, congruent to the audio uh, bitstream. Uh, it goes around, so it, it may not even go the same route. Uh, and mm -hmm. we all know what's going to happen there. There's latencies that will build up there. Um, uh, you've got... Uh, then it goes to the server, it gets cached in the server, and then it squirts out of the server in line with the audio at this metadata interval. Um, for example, for IceCast, the default metadata interval is 16,000 bytes. Um, and that, 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 can be, that can be a long time, especially if you're relying on this uh, for commercial insertion and you're running a tight format and you expect these commercials to go in and out when on your terms instead of its terms. Uh, it can't be achieved. Um, I've had this conversation with a number of the uh, commercial insertion services, and uh, uh, that conversation has been pretty much like pushing string uphill, which is scary in itself. <laughs> now, when you speak but, of this kind uh, of uh, commercial insertion, we're talking about stream splicing, right? Where the, correct, the, the commercial correct. is getting spliced there's, in yeah, there's, somewhere there's, down downstream. Yeah, there's essentially two ways to do it. One, you can do it on the, um, on the encoder side, which is a more elegant way to do it. Problem there is you can only splice one stream in. So uh, if you want to do anything targeted, it's got to go on the network side. If it goes on the network uh -huh. side, uh, now you've got another uh, big house of cards. Uh, for one thing, it can't be processed through the same audio processor as everything else, so trying to get yeah. the audio texture lined up is, uh, is a big problem. Uh, trying to explain this uh, to the Internet crowd about audio texture and the creative that's behind all of that is yet another problem. That, yeah, uh, that's your uphill string right there, too. <laughs> yeah, the first thing they tell you, well, what, what do you mean? I can hear it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but that's pretty much the attitude you get with, with most everybody that's servicing the Internet. So all that being said, that's what happens. So you've got to stream splice. You've got to worry about um, getting it spliced correctly. It's got to be done at the audio frames. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of detail there. A lot all of right. detail. And I think maybe a third point of pain with traditional streaming is uh, bit rate versus uh, who, who are your listeners and where are they at and what connectivity do they have? Correct. Um, you're sitting here with a network like we have here, and you know, hey, you got 12 megabits to deal with entertainment if you want. But uh, on uh, this guy, that's another story. And uh, oh yeah, then there's then there's this guy. This ah. guy <laughs> is a real important thing. Yeah, because because that's where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> that's and, a factor, and I hadn't thought about that, but that's a good good point. Yeah, because um, and this is this is the age old argument of, about MP3. Um, MP3 to get any kind of uh, decent fidelity, you've got to be up at 128 kilobits per second. That's expensive. It's yeah. expensive for mediocre quality. You get to AAC, and you know, I mean, 32 kilobits isn't great. But uh, at least you have 15 kilohertz response with it. Uh, but you can get to 64 and get really good quality with AAC. And yeah. that's half as much money. Yeah. Um, it's half as much money. And it's twice the, uh, twice the bandwidth. Uh, the other thing that you get with all of that is you get twice the reliability. Or four times the reliability if you're down at 32. You see, all these guys on these networks... 
they they tell you that you know they'll give you. I, I can go I can go outside here, right 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 outside the door, and I, I can show you a speed test. I could probably do it in here, and it's going to be about thirty or forty megabits per second. It's going to mm-hmm. look really good. I can go yeah. down. I, we're up on a hill, and we're actually above the beam on the on the closest uh, uh, on the closest cell site. But if I go down the hill, I'll get eighty megabits on that phone. It's wow. it's it's pretty incredible. Yeah. But sustained is a different story. Yeah, yeah. What do you and find? That, you, you get that's over a long where HLS. Time? That's where HLS comes in. Okay, mm-hmm. HLS is a protocol that looks to a device like a web page that you are looking at forever. It's kind of like you're looking at the web page and clicking on something about every ten or 20 seconds. You know, Greg, and, you've just explained something in a really good way. This, this is a good elevator speech for either you or for me trying to explain this. Earlier you said you compared Shoutcast or Icecast uh, or, or uh, Adobe Streaming. Uh, you, you said you used the word contiguous. And, you know, uh, we don't use that word often. We usually use it to describe the contiguous United States, you know, the 48 states, right? Uh, but it, it's contiguous. It's it, the, the packets are one after another after another now they they may there may be some there's some time between them but it 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 is conti- it's a constant me you server client connection it's always there whereas with adaptive rate streaming and we're going to be talking about apple hls you said you just said it's like a fi- it's like a, a web page it see it acts like a web page it acts like file little file little file little file and correct and, and then there's some intelligence, uh, we'll get to this later, but there's some intelligence in the player to know which version of the website to get, the full rich version with lots of stuff or the little skinny version that still has the audio at, at a decent audio quality. That is correct. And anybody who's familiar with our uh, Streams Hi-Fi radio app for uh, iPhone, there's an interesting tool that you can get as a, uh, um, uh in-app purchase there's a bit meter, and I don't know how well this is going to work here. Let's just see if I can make this. Yeah, there we go. You can see I've got an HLS stream. Oh, man. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's such a delay in the, uh, in the video here. It's hard for me to get this thing positioned. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's glaring. I know. It's tough to we'll show get, stuff like we'll that. We'll get it here, maybe. In any, in any regard, the bit meter. Uh, oh. <laughs> Okay, I guess it would help if if the screen save didn't kick in. Okay, there we go. You can see the uh, you can see the spikes there. Those are the HLS segments that come in, and with a normal stream, that'll just be a flat line straight across. Okay, that's a so, uh, that, that, that that's that, an option. That, that, <laughs> That's an option that I need to to uh, purchase. I, I don't have that on on mine. I've got your app on on my big old fashioned uh, uh, iPad here. Oh yeah, uh, but yeah. I, I'd uh, send you a promo code if I could, but they they don't give us a mechanism to send uh, promo codes for the in app portion of all of this. So uh, you'll have to settle for lunch the next time we see one. <laughs> That's fine. I don't I don't mind putting a few dollars <laughs> on that. That's pretty cool. But I, I have I have recommended this. We gave away a few of these apps uh, uh, a couple of years ago when we first had you on. But I love this app because uh, do you vet? I should tell people what this is. This is an app where you you pick radio stations or uh, or other web broadcasters and, and listen to them, and every one of them sounds good. How do you vet that? Uh, we we do vet them. We do vet them. Uh, for one thing, we don't list any MP3. It's all AAC exclusive. It's the only app that I know of that uh, is about quality rather than quantity. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, we we've got like uh, five or six thousand streams in there at this point, and it's harder than hell to keep it all maintained because. The uh, the amount of uh, uh, changes in stream URLs every day is just it's mind numbing, but we do our best, and uh, you know I urge anybody that uh, that that should get the app if 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 you run across URLs that don't work, please by all means email us because we we'd love to hear from our users. Uh, we just don't get enough feedback from uh, from dead URLs, and we we've got some spiders that try to deal with it, but. The other problem is, is everybody in the world is streaming with a slightly different spin on things, so the uh, spiders don't always work on everybody, and on and on and on. But uh, 
back to it's HLS, just, this uh, yeah, business yeah. of being able to make these streams look like uh, web pages, the one huge advantage from a CDN point of view, that's the content distribution network, is uh -huh. you don't need a streaming server to stream live anymore. And uh, we've got a uh, we've got a web page set up, and uh, it's at www.etherstream.net slash couple places either slash eight that's the number eight for flash players or slash HTML5 for native HTML5 support of which is very abbreviated at the moment but. Uh, there are two browsers that have native HLS support at this point, Microsoft Windows um, uh, Edge browser for Windows 10. You can punch in that URL, the, the direct M3 U8. It plays right in the browser. And, of course, Mac, iOS, uh, and OS X. Uh, the Apple folks have done the best job of implementing everything there is to know about HLS. No surprise there. They invented it. Uh, but they support everything that you could possibly think of. And, of course, uh, iTunes also plays HLS. Yeah. So, we're going uh, 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 to take a, a quick break here for a sponsor, uh, Greg. And so in the first half of the show, we've been talking about streaming and, and the issues that, that streaming has had over the years. The, the one, You know what, Greg? Let's take another two minutes uh, before we break and talk about the, the thing that I brought up about different bit rates that a station, uh, if a radio station wants to stream, they kind of have to decide, okay, do we uh, stream at a high bit rate, at a low bit rate, at a medium bit rate? Do we stream at several bit rates and make the customer, make the listener choose which one? Do we stream in MP3 or AAC and make the customer choose which app is going to be associated with which stream? You know, there's, there's so much we end up either compromising in what we do or we put it on the listener to make a decision, neither of which is a great solution. Is, hasn't that been one of the problems with streaming? Uh, that's been another problem, and you are absolutely correct. HLS, as well as MPEG-DASH, by the way, um, HLS and MPEG-DASH are very, very closely related. They're delivered pretty much the same way. Uh, the fundamental difference there being the file formats. Um, but uh, be that as it may, uh, the way this works very quickly is the player client will make a request to the web server, um, which is now the streaming server, in essence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It makes a request to the web server for a file. Uh, in the case of HLS, it's an M3U8 file, which is what's referred to as a, a playlist or a manifest file. Mm -hmm. And in that playlist file, it lists uh, typically three or four streams of various bit rates. And should your player client support that selection, it can make a determination as to which stream to use on the basis of your location or your network speed. So ah. one URL to describe f up to four streams usually. Uh, Apple specifies three. We, uh, in our encoders, you can specify four. And uh, they're all synchronous. And mm -hmm. if you're... Um, at home on a good Wi-Fi network, for example, you'll pull in 256K. And if you're out oot in a boot, um, you do uh, 32K, for example. We're going to explore that uh, and how the players uh, you know, choose which one. And, and you said that the, the, the streams, uh, and again, they're not really streams, they're files, but they're synchronous. So if your player switches from one to another because the, the available bandwidth changed, uh, the, you as the listener will probably not notice the difference. If, if You probably won't even notice the difference in quality, although you might. Uh, and I, we'll relate that to the way uh, something like Netflix works in just a minute. Hey, our show, this is uh, This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 281. Our, gre our guest is Greg Oganowski. We're talking specifically about implementing uh, Apple uh, HLS streaming. So Greg and I have talked about the difficulties with streaming to this point for audio broadcasters, and we're going to get into uh, some of the benefits and how you get into Apple HLS. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Telos and the Telos HX6 phone system. Hey, if you are putting together any kind of uh, content or you want to talk to listeners, listener callers, or you want to do interviews uh, with guests, the Telos HX6 is amazing. It is lo low cost compared to the way you have to do this in the past. This one rack unit box gives you inside two 
telephone hybrids. And these are Telos's best fifth generation telephone hybrid technology. Um, this box takes POTS lines coming in. There's an ISDN version available too, although, you know, ISDN for the most part is, is going away. Um, you can generate your POTS lines locally from SIP if you want to, or if you get POTS lines from your telephone company provider, you can do that too. Hey, I even know of people who are using uh, things like a Vonage, uh, several Vonage boxes uh, to provide their uh, uh, their POTS lines. There's all kinds of different ways to get, you know, good old-fashioned POTS to come into this box. At my radio stations, we're actually using a SIP to POTS converter uh, uh, to bring POTS lines uh, in, into our HX6 for our different radio stations. But because you've got two telephone hybrids in there, that means you can, the right way, the right way you can put two callers on the air at the same time. Maybe you've got an expert guest on on uh, on line six, and that, that's your hotline, right? And then you want to bring in listener callers, and they can conference with each other. Well, the, the HX6 does conferencing all by itself. Let's say you've got an older audio console. You, you don't have an Axia console. You don't have a console that does automatic mix minus. No problem. The HX6 can take a single mix minus from your audio console and properly cross-feed the two callers, you know, the expert guest, for example, and the listener caller on the other line. And mix in, of course, your mix minus audio, you know, your your announcer, your local people, your local host there, their voice, uh, and any music played on the console along with that. So everybody hears everybody exactly right. Something else that's cool is that each of the two hybrids has its very own Omnia audio processing on the call. So the caller's levels are consistent from call to call. There's even automatic equalization uh, on each call. So as much as possible, even the tonal timber, the quality of each caller is relatively the same. Somebody calls in from a smartphone, somebody calls in from a, you know, an old home telephone that's got the carbon granules packed together, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. Um, uh, you've, you've got consistent call to call quality. So that's a really, really good uh, benefit there. And the HX6 incorporates every single trick that TELUS has learned over 30 plus years as to how to keep uh, feedback from happening. So you can even use the HX6 in an environment where you've got open mic and open speakers. Think the Phil Donahue talk show. Okay, some of you aren't old enough to remember the Phil Donahue talk show. You've got a television studio, you've got an, a studio audience, and you've got callers calling in, being put on the overhead speakers, and you've got a guest, I mean a host, walking around the, uh, the audience with a microphone. That's open mic and open speakers. And you can still carry on a conversation with a caller that way um, and not have feedback because of the tricks that Telos builds into uh, the HX6. The HX6 also uses the now really famous and easy to use Telos VSET 6, uh, which is, it looks like a telephone. It's a controller for the HX6. Those connect over your Ethernet network. So you can, you can stick the HX6 back in a closet somewhere in your rack room. It doesn't have to be in the studio. And then you can uh, just, through your Ethernet network, your standard business network that doesn't have to be a live wire network, uh, you can plug in these, these telephones uh, and control the system from that. It's amazingly uh, easy to install and use. Um, I, I use one of them myself at our stations. Uh, it also, by the way, does live wire. So the HX6 has your standard XLR connectors for audio in, audio out, you know, the, the, the send to the caller, the caller's voice coming out, music on hold, or as we say in our biz, program on hold. Uh, those inputs are all there. But if you want to do all that with live wire, you can do that too. If you're already a live wire studio, then you have another choice. Uh, you can buy the HX6 or you can save a few dollars and buy the IQ6. It's functionally identical, except it doesn't have the XLR connectors. It only has a live wire jack on the back of it. Uh, well, plus the phone line jacks. Check it out if you would on the web. I love this, uh, this talk show system. It works really well. Uh, and the callers sound great. Uh, by the way, it does come with uh, call screening software. It comes right with it uh, from the folks at Broadcast Bionics. So go to telosalliance.com. And look at Telos and look for uh, on-air phone systems. You'll find the Telos HX6 right there. And it's sort of cousin, the IQ6. It's just missing its XLR connectors. You don't have to pay for them. All right, thanks to uh, Telos for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, it's Kirk Harnack along with Greg Oganowski. And uh, let's see, did uh, Chris Tobin still hasn't been able to make it to a, a Skype machine yet, so we're waiting on Chris to see if, if uh, he'll be able to, uh, to join us for this show. Uh, and so, Greg, uh, we've talked about issues with streaming, and let's jump into now talking about uh, Apple HLS. You said a, a moment ago, and you, you provide a link, 
uh, that people can listen to these some of these streams themselves, and they, they sound like streams. Um, you mentioned this manifest file, that, and and so when you give a link out to your your stream, you're really giving a link to this file sitting on a file server somewhere. Tell me about about that file again. Yeah, before we get into that file, I just uh, meant to mention you forgot to give the 800 number and say uh, uh, the 800 number, you know, is supposed to be in there and then you're supposed to call, call direct or collect except in Nebraska. Don't call that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> call by midnight tonight. No cops. That was, yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> Operator standing by. That's right. So you, you have this playlist file, the manifest file, and it has a list of uh, uh, streams in it. Uh, the player client makes a determination as to what it's going to do next. So then it goes and it determines, let's say, for example, that it's going to deliver you 256 kilobits. So then it gets another file, which is a variant, what they call a variant file. And inside that playlist, this is where the heavy lifting all happens, is a list of these chunk files which in the case of Apple HLS are uh, ADTS AAC files. And it's like a, 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 a machine that goes like this. That's how it works. Okay. How's that? <laughs> that's good. That that's, sounds that's, like the elevator speech. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, the, that's tech speak for how it works. I, I, actually, you know how I envisioned this? I was trying to figure out how to explain or, this. Or like this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> have Have you ever seen Have you seen that commercial where uh, the guy's making sausage in the grocery store and he's like putting live baby pigs in the box and cranking the crank and out comes links of sausage? There so, you go. And, well, and, and you people know, are horrified. That's, that, oh, that is, that, that's how this works. Actually, yeah. So you you've got. I mean, if you didn't make the links, you'd have this continuous tube of sausage. So what you've got is is that you know the, they they spin the the casing and they make uh, you know a sausage link. And then the sausage link is like a file. And so it contains a certain amount of data that is a certain number of seconds or milliseconds of no, the audio seconds, stream. Seconds. It's, yeah. usually, it's usually 10, 20, 30 seconds, depending on what you decide to do. And we'll get to, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But so, uh, what so, I would so, yeah. so, so you, you said this, you this variant up, file up, contains a, a list of the, uh, of, of, of the, the files in their numerical sequence or whatever it is. Right, with, with a few other pieces of important information for the player client, because the player okay. client is going to need to know when to go get another manifest file, because after it plays what's there, uh, it's going to run out. So it needs to know, oh, got to get the manifest updated so we can get the next set of segments. So it continually updates the manifest file as all of these segments or sausage links get updated on the web server. Okay. Now, in the case of our encoder, our encoders do an awful lot of management. And uh, believe it or not, we've come full circle, and we, we call our encoders internally Project 959. And uh, for any of the geeks out there, if they put two and two together, 959, what could that possibly be? Well, how about RFC 959? It's one of the Internet's oldest protocols. Oh. Uh, we are now streaming using FTP. Okay. Basically, basically, <laughs> basically the whole HLS thing is, it, 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 you know, it's complicated in so many ways, but in so many ways it's dumb as dirt because all it is is FTPing files and you've got something to tell the cl uh, player clients when to go get them and play them. But the beautiful thing about this is all of this can go over anybody's web HTTP infrastructure, uh -huh. their existing web server caches, uh -huh. all their existing investment. All of it can be used for this without having to change a thing. And here's where it even gets better. I told you we'd get back to the uh, segment length. Um, if you use 10 seconds... For segment lengths, okay, uh, the the files come in in these ten second chunks, but um, you'll usually have like anywhere from thirty to a minute, or possibly two minutes. Uh, we had the advantage of being able to work with a 
very huge client with all of this. And we even experimented with some four minute stuff, which literally means you can go away from the network for four minutes and your stream never stops. Mm, that mm. can't with Shoutcast or Icecast unless you built in a huge, huge buffer into the player. And I don't know of anybody who's ever gone that far. Mm -hmm. So as far as robustness and reliability and low cost, I mean, this protocol has basically delivered on anything anybody could possibly want. I mean, you're streaming over FTP. Uh, we also offer FTPS. You can use dumb storage like the Amazon Cloud um, or, uh, or, or Rackspace or Azure um, any, any Wait, so, so, so I can use an Amazon web server or Azure or any place I can stick a Absolutely. file. Yeah. That can be my web stream server now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because it, it, our, our streams it, are now file-based rather than contiguous stream-based. That is correct. And over on those, um, on those sites that I gave you are some uh, interesting little surprises. The bottom two streams, number seven is down at the moment. I'm, I'm working on that. As a matter of fact, I'm working on that today. Uh, it'll, it'll be up later. But all the other ones are served from one machine. There are eight playout systems running on one computer. There are eight Orban, Optimod, PC natives running on that computer. There's SQL Server running on it. And there are 64 streaming encoders running on that one box. We call that box Jocks in the Box. And mm -hmm. we've got another one in the lab that's running 16. That's, uh, that's another interesting beast. And uh, uh, I've probably got uh, a 32 in the wind here before long. Uh, but be that as it may, the uh, last two streams were actually streaming in surround. So if um, we'll be putting up a, a configuration page as to how to configure your sound uh, to be able to hear all six channels. And uh, we've got uh, one stream that is upmixed from stereo sources and the one, number seven, which is the one I'm working on today. Um, we've got a, a surround playout system that's going to dish out genuine six-channel program material. So that'll, be a, uh, that'll end up being a live stream uh, with six-channel sources. And uh, if you look at those surround streams, they're all uh, pointing to racks, rax.index.com.com. If you do a reverse lookup on that uh, from your location, you'll see that that points back to Akamai. And if you do the pings on those, you're probably in the department of like five milliseconds, no matter where you are in the world. Uh, yeah. the, advantage that, uh, the advantage that this all has, once you get on the Akamai network, for example, is Akamai has over 170 thousand edge servers all over the world so you ingest uh, on a CDN such as um, uh, Amazon AWS glue it to Akamai and you are literally uh, serving the world with millisecond ping times hmm wow um, this is almost really, more than, than I can take in. I'd love, I'd love to give that, uh, give that a test up at the space station. I'd love to know what their ping times would be. <laughs> Do you think one of their 170,000 is on the space station? It probably is. <laughs> <laughs> so that, there must, with, that many, with that many edge servers, there must be one down the street from me. Uh, I'm sure there is. There's one down the street from me. I can tell you that any of my wow. buddies in L.A. connect to all different edge servers. I don't connect to the same one they do. It's all mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Wow. Oh. All right, so um, what are, um, I mean, thinking about either your software, your encoders, or speaking in generally, what are some of the things that engineers uh, who, who are setting this up need to have in mind? What, what, you know, what, what modeling in their head do they need to understand about this? And then how do they kind of get their feet wet in, in streaming in Apple HLS? Well, first, the first order of business for like a terrestrial radio station where there's obviously a, a studio involved uh, if they're not so lucky to have some audio over IP, such as Axia or Ravenna, they've got to get the audio into the box. And we solved that problem with these guys here. This is uh, what you call a Streams IO Digi. And uh, uh, it's just a real simple thing. It's bus powered. 
Uh, no drivers need to go in. This works on Mac, PC, even iOS. You can plug it into your iPhone if you want digital I.O. But it's mm. a great little box. Uh, it's AES, so it's good to go for the pro community. Um, yeah. They're inexpensive. And uh, the new ad, as it says, is need a quickie, use the Streams I.O. Digi. There you go. Okay. So you get your audio into the encoder and point this encoder to your ingest server mm -hmm. and go home and listen. It's just that simple. Okay. Now, when you're, when you're setting up um, an encoder and, and um, maybe this, there's a thing in there called a segmenter. I heard you use that term when we were talking earlier today. Uh, a segmenter. And, and what are some of the parameters that you feel would be standard that you want to set? What are some of the bit rates or the encoding algorithms or in, indeed the, the segment lengths that you would want to set up? All of the old HLS mechanisms that have been brought to the market so far have involved the use of another streaming server. And they would ingest either an ICY, which is a shoutcast or icecast stream, or an RTMP stream. Now, right from the get-go, that starts with all of the baggage and all of the nasty things that all of those protocols um, uh, have. And then it would get translated to HLS segments. Mm, Our okay. encoders use HLS direct. All the heavy lifting is done in the encoder itself. So all of the segmentation and file management is all done in the encoder. So that means after the uh, segments have expired in the manifest file, then the mm -hmm. encoder goes back and cleans them out so that you don't uh, end up with a, uh, uh, an endless bit bucket of, of trash. And right. it keeps everything right. nice and clean. All you've got in there is just about a minute of audio or whatever you've configured your encoder to do. Now, um, now, but, if I could, if I could uh, if, see if I can get something understood. It sounds like there's a couple ways to get this done. Earlier today, I was part of a webinar with the folks at Wowza, and, and their business model and their service is that you send them a good old-fashioned RTMP stream, and they offer to do the, the heavy lifting, as you put it, of making segmented streams at different bit rates. And, uh, and as engineering purists, you and I think, okay, well, th that's one way to do it. But maybe we're better off doing the, uh, as you call it, HLS Direct, having our own encoder uh, make these files for the different bit rates and then either hosting them ourselves or just shoving them off to a server in the cloud to be hosted and, and eliminate any transcoding. Correct. The, the other advantage to being able to do all of the heavy lifting in the encoder is you're able to do frame-accurate metadata, which was the oh, other thing we, yeah. we spoke about. Yeah. So you're, you're like, you know, plus or minus 20 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds. It, it depends on whether you're AAC or uh, HEAAC um, mm -hmm. as to that. But, I mean, that's really, really tight. Um, okay. So you're going to be able to use that metadata for queuing. Um, it makes the uh, ad insertion or any kind of other content insertion uh, uh, very accurate. And uh, you're able to um, leverage the, the, target, um, the target spots that everybody wants to do right now with this technology. So that, that, is, that is a great thing. You don't have to worry about server latencies, server caches. And mm -hmm. the metadata is all in line with the audio. It travels right with it. It's the same socket connection, so mm -hmm. it can never walk. Uh, the only place it could walk is if the player clients don't uh, deal with it correctly. But right through the encoder and right through the web server, it can never, ever walk. We've kind of, uh, you know, you've gotten off in, in the weeds here a, a few times on really technical stuff, and, and I appreciate that very much. Um, can you, in the few minutes we have left, uh, and by the way, what we're going to do, we're going to talk for a few minute, more minutes. I've got one more commercial to do. And then if you could come back with a, a tip or a website that you found particularly helpful. Of course, the one you gave out earlier is pretty cool. Uh, folks want to go to that. We can mention that again. But that's I'm going to ask you for maybe a little tip after the after our last commercial. Uh, but you, you mentioned earlier in the show, okay, we've been talking about Apple HLS, and that does seem to be uh, becoming well, well accepted. But there's also Microsoft Smooth Streaming, and there's MPEG Dash that you mentioned as well. Do you want to uh, uh, talk about uh, where you think the, the what you know, where's this train headed? 
and 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 who's going to be on it? Um, okay. you know, well, to be obviously, Apple went first with all of this, and then um, I'm just looking for something here because let, let me let me just look for something really quick. I want to pull it up on my screen so I can refer to it in just a bit. Okay, that's good. We'll get back to that. Okay. Sorry. All right. um, uh, as you say, Microsoft has their smooth stream. Um, mm -hmm. Adobe has another one called HDS. Um, oh, of course. Both of these have very little little traction um, on the uh, by comparison to HLS and uh, MPEG Dash. HLS was first to the party, so okay. uh, and obviously, um, the Apple folks, being the media company that they are, um, they've done a beautiful job of implementing it and promoting it and making sure that it actually all works. Um, that, that's, that's one thing about the internet that, that I've noticed is that there's an awful lot of show and not necessarily much go. But um, that is not the Apple way of doing business. They try their hardest, they try their best at actually trying to make things work. What a concept. And uh, uh, for those in, uh, of us in uh, a professional broadcast, that really is the way to go. I mean, I know there's an awful lot of Android use out there, but, uh, you know, if you're in the media business, get a media device. And uh, it's, it's pretty much uh, guaranteed to work. Um, I just put something up a little bit earlier, for example, and you could, that site uh, that uh, I mentioned, the EtherStream, yeah. if, you, if you just bring that up in Safari, for example, all of the, the players will show up in there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they'll like, play the yeah. video delay is really hard to, to, to show yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um, in any way they, they all play in there and uh, if you try to do that in any of the desktop browsers uh, that, that's going to be a problem although it will work in Safari for uh, Mac and it will work as I pointed out in uh, uh, the Microsoft Edge browser ah, yeah you did say that uh, I have, believe it or not on my, um, on my Android phone um well i, I it uh, I, the first time i tried to play an hls stream in my android in cr the chrome browser on on the android phone it said okay what what app do you want me to use to play this and i yeah, chose the you, point it, the you point it to chrome you've got a like a 95 percent chance that it's going to do it chrome's coming along yeah, yeah. Uh, and chrome for android is a little bit different build than it is for uh, the desktops okay uh, okay it appears that Chrome for Android has some HLS natively built in it because some of those streams, and the reason I say some, I can't explain it, it's buggy. For w whatever reason, on the, on the device that we tried earlier this morning, streams one and two play, five and six play, uh, but three and four don't play for some unexplained reason. I, I don't oh. get that. Maybe oh, it doesn't yeah. like numbers yeah. three or four. I, I don't get well, there, it. But well, it, there's no doubt that, that like, yeah, if you want to you want to make this work, use an Apple device. I'm just pointing out that I've I've actually had some good luck demonstrating the correct. HLS streams that I made on an Android device. Now I also demoed them on on my uh, iPad as well. Uh, so right. uh, just to show that hey, it works on now, both. There, now there's another technology that I'd like to point out real quick. I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's important for this. All of the new browsers are uh, supporting uh, a protocol called MSE, and it's the, the, the media source extensions. If you have an MSE compliant browser, it is possible to write appropriate JavaScript to make an HTML5 player work. And we're working on an HLS player right now uh, that will do this. There are a number of them available right now. Um, many of them only support transport stream. That's HLS, the .ts extension, right? That's the .ts extension, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And th this, is, uh, this was the page that I wanted to refer to that uh, uh, is another place that you might want to look. Over on our website at indexcom.com, uh, if you go into tech, uh, there's a thing there uh, called HLS Audio ESTS. You guys might want to look over there for some more information. Um, or if you would just want to cut to the chase, indexcom.com uh, slash white paper slash ESTS. And it goes into uh, great detail as to what the advantages are there. Um, 
It is an Apple recommendation that you use ES for audio only. It is much lighter on the network because there's no padding. Ah, TS yeah. has gobs and gobs of padding. So you're sending lots of zeros and your audience is paying for all those zeros uh, in more ways than just with the spender. It's not just the spender. It's also a reliability issue. And uh, because now you've got to you've got to account for all those zeros which are part of the equation and if you don't get the zeros even though they don't account for anything they account for the data and if they get displaced then you have reliability issues so uh, our encoders are all ES based for that reason gotcha gotcha okay so uh, do you have a choice of, of the of that file extension ES or TS or anything else uh, the file or extension for transport streams is certainly dot TS for ES which stands for elementary stream yeah. Uh, the file extension there in the case of AAC will be .AAC. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All yeah. right. Now, I remember, I'm comparing what you're telling me with my own experience with the company that I work for and, and what we're making. So I'm just trying to find, okay, I understand this from our point of view. How does this work on, on, on your end? And are we really talking about the any, same thing or not? Any, so. Yeah. Anybody, anybody who's doing HLS and... Uh, if it complies with, there's there are fifty thousand different ways to do HLS. I'll tell you that. Right. <laughs> of course, why, why uh, wouldn't there really be? Only there, there, there is more than one to do it right, but for the most part, there's only one way to do it right. Yeah. Um, we uh, we had the advantage of being able to learn from the masters. I'll just leave it at that, and uh, uh, we got the job done, and uh, it. Uh, is fully 100% Apple compliant, uh, but anybody that is streaming uh, with Apple compliance, their elementary streams for AAC will be .AAC segments. Gotcha. Understood. Understood. Hey, we're talking to Greg Oganowski. He uh, agreed to join us for our show today and talk to us about HLS streaming. And, you know, it, it may take a while to get your head all wrapped, wrapped around this. Uh, uh, I would I got to suggest uh, that if you're interested in this kind of technology and you're, you're if you're a broadcast engineer or you're a streaming engineer, you're going to need to understand this. And uh, right now there's a couple of big companies, Greg's company, as well as the company that I work for, make uh, software and hardware products that do this. Get one of them or get a demo or something so you can begin to play and understand. Playing with The way I learn is just playing with stuff and understand what works, what doesn't. Oh, yeah, there are five ways to do this where it doesn't work, but hey, there's a couple ways to do it where it does work. So that's what we're talking to, Greg Oganowski. We're going to finish up with a tip in a final word in just a minute. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at Lavo, L-A-W-O, Lavo.com. They make audio consoles, and they make an audio console just for radio broadcasters or others, others who are, you know, smaller outfits producing um, uh, audio content, and it's the uh, it's the crystal clear console. This is an innovative, amazing little console. It uses uh, the crystal console's one rack unit mix engine. So this has the audio I/O on it. It's got some mic inputs, line level inputs, AES digital inputs, and some outputs too, uh, both uh, analog and AES digital outputs on it. So those are built into the back of the, of this thing. Then it also has a network connection. Now, of course, you can browse into it that way. In fact, that's how the, the clear part, that is the, the, uh, the touchscreen surface, connects to uh, the, 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 the crystal part of it, the mix engine. Um, but also, that Ethernet connection speaks Ravenna, and it's also compatible with AES67. So you can have your audio over IP with the Crystal Clear console from Lavo. Uh, it also has available uh, dual redundant power supplies there. So, uh, you know, if your power on one circuit fails or one of the power supplies fails, you've got the other one to keep things powered up as well. Now, what about the clear part? That's the part where you touch. Well, if you go to the website and, uh, and have a look, uh, you can see a video there where Mike Dosh, who's the director of virtual radio projects there, he sh gives you a demonstration of how the crystal clear uh, radio mixing console works. Um, as far as the user, well, you see this beautiful, big, multi-touch touchscreen. And 
the console is in software. It's in even the visually. There is no you know hardware faders that move up and down. You do it on a touch screen, and they're designed, of course, with you know big, easy to touch faders that are easy to move up and down. Uh, because it's multi touch, it's very natural. You know, if you're used to using an iPad or other multi touch touch screen interface, you already have a little bit of an idea of how this works. It's really quite natural. Um, the buttons that you select there are big, and what's even cooler is because everything is done in software. Uh, everything is contextual. So you you won't have to wade through menus of stuff that don't apply to you uh, because everything it, – it knows, hey, if I want to touch the options button on a source, on a fader that is a microphone, I'm just going to give you the microphone-related options. I'm not going to make you wade through a bunch of other stuff. And that's how they've designed the whole console to work. Of course, it's got a big honking clock on it. Uh, you can keep that accurate with NTP protocol time. Um, uh, you can do automatic mix minuses or automatic back feeds to any of the sources. So if you've got people in another room on microphones, you can you know properly send them the proper back feed to their headphones, which means you can interrupt it. You know you can talk to them. Uh, same thing for uh, codecs for remote reporters uh, or you know remote programming coming in. Uh, hybrids as well. Yeah, automatic mix minus to those things as well. Check it out if you would on the web. Go to Lavo. That's L A W O dot com and look for uh, radio products and look for the crystal clear virtual radio mixing console. It is cool. All right, Greg Oganowski and Kirk Harnack are here with you on This Week in Radio Tech. And uh, Greg, can I put you on the spot and ask you to pass along some kind of a tip where our listeners and viewers may, uh, may learn something uh, after the show? Uh, well, you see this here. This is, uh, this is a clock. This is uh, official stream swag, and uh, <laughs> we, we we have a joke here in the uh, uh, laboratories: is the one with two clocks doesn't know what time it is. You mentioned so this if, earlier on the show, yeah. If, if you have two of these, then you definitely don't know what time it is. But <laughs> um, one of the one of the cool things about the streams encoders is they also have an ability to not only lock to NTP but PTP if you're social so such lucky uh -huh. and uh it is an attempt at keeping everybody uh on time and what's really cool is if somebody wanted to build a player client that was uh, locked to gps mm -hmm. then it could probably be about as good as those axia or ravenna protocols all over the internet. so so when you you mentioned earlier in the show when you stream for a long period of time it's it's it is absolutely going to happen that there will be some kind of and I don't know if you call it sample slipping or packet slipping, but one of the clocks, either the encoder or the decoder, yeah, is somebody, going to be faster than somebody. Faster than somebody's going to give. I mean, the chances of the yeah. two clocks being exactly the same frequency are slim to none, as you very well know. Crystals are very, very uh, close, but I mean, anybody that's uh, looked at the clock on their PC can vouch for the fact that you know how far off they can be. And uh, the, sound, the, the time base for uh, an audio capture, um, like for, you know, if you have an audio device that yeah. uh, is capturing the audio, here's the time base. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it's actually not the computer crystal, but, the, but it's the crystal, crystal on here. Okay. Um, in the case of of uh, something like Axia or Ravenna, then the time base will be PTP based um, as we move into AES 67. AES 67 is all PTP based, which is uh, IEEE yeah. 158. So yeah. um, that's the time base there. Uh, in the case of our jocks in the box, um, that, that's an interesting animal because there is no sound card. Um, that's mm -hmm. assuming that the playout system is on the same machine that the encoders live. So yeah. there, you're at, there you're at the mercy of PTP again. But provided you can get all that locked in, then you can get pretty damn close to staying on time. But if you're at the mercy of a sound card, um, you, uh, you know, some sound cards, especially if they're analog and they're consumer-driven, uh, consumer there's, there's no mechanism to lock that. Um, you could use word clock maybe, um, but then you've got to worry about, um, 
you've got to worry about keeping the rest of the encoder on time. So there's really, there's really two time mechanisms that you've got to keep under control, and the, the streams encoders deal with both of those. Now, the good news about even though we have different clocks and it bothers engineers like, like you and others who, who really have to worry about these things, the, the end result is an, an occasional glitch in, in decoded audio when you're streaming. And that Correct. occasional glitch might be very, very, very occasional with a long time between them. It, it, it might be every few minutes or so, but it might be every few hours or even days. Yeah, yeah it, it, that, is, that is correct. I mean, it, it all depends on how close your crystals are. Yeah. It, it, you just never know. And it's not going to be the same on, on two different devices. So that, it is what it is. You, you, every time you talk about this, I keep thinking of, like, sands through the hourglass. <laughs> what, such are the days of our lives. There it is. <laughs> there it is. He stole it from the set, ladies and gentlemen, in Hollywood. All right, we got to go. Our show's been uh, brought to you by the folks at uh, at Axia and also the folks at Telos and the folks at Lavo, and I appreciate very much uh, them sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Uh, you've been uh, enjoying the last hour with uh, me, Kirk Harnack, and I guess uh, I guess Chris Tobin must have got stuck in the subway or something. He wasn't able to to make it here. I'm I'm sad about that, but I'm sure he'll be back uh, next. Yeah, he's still not online. I'm, I hope he had a good time wherever he was and, and got out of uh, whatever he was doing. Uh, and uh, Greg Oganowski, thank you for being with us. I hope you'll come back and join us again uh, some other time. And um, you know, if uh, at some point, I'd love you just to we we could figure out how to share your screen and have you talk over it and maybe show us some setup so engineers can you know once they start to get their head wrapped around this, they can really start to see an implementation of uh, of, of of HLS streaming and and uh, and experience it to experience, you know, how good it can be. Uh, we'll put the link to your web page with those eight different streams. We'll put that in the show notes so folks can just click on that and uh, and as long as they're using a, a decent browser, can hear it. That'd be great. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks right. once again for uh, having us here. And uh, we'd love to do it again. And as you say, we could do some uh, screen shares and show it all in action. All right, good deal. All right, folks, uh, thanks a lot to Suncast for producing the show. He's always on top of the video switching in the lower thirds and keeping us uh, on time, whispering in my ear if I got to have it. <laughs> and also Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, for making this possible as well. Uh, for Chris Tobin, I'm Kirk Harnack. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.